and welcome to episode 85 of Real Life Ghost Stories. How you do? To kick things off this week, we need to thank our newest Patreon subscribers. We would like to thank Alex. James Doherty. April Carter. Lucy Moore. Sarah Foggin. Rose Griffith. Kaylin. Matt Tobin. Orly. Marlene Garibay. Johnny Carr. Gabrielle Capello. Frankie Jenkins. Dawn D. Dempsey. Meg. Francesca Gibbons. Anna Rowley. Taria Ochoa. April Carter. Flora Watson. Amy Fortenberry. Melissa Mullen. Thank you all so much for your Patreon subscriptions. We are very appreciative of you. I cannot say that word. Appreciative? Yeah. Is that it? Is that the word? Yeah, we appreciate you. We appreciate you. That's better. So... We've got another promo for you this week. We're coming to the end of our promos. I think we've got one more to go after this. Okay. I hope people have found them useful. I hope that you've found some new podcasts to love and binge from us doing promos during lockdown. And today's promo is a podcast called We Drink and We Know Things. So We Drink and We Know Things is a husband and wife team, Tom and Andrea, and they do a true crime ghosts conspiracies and anything weird sort of podcast and they describe it as a weekly podcast doused in alcohol and lit with knowledge so we're gonna play their promo hello hello i'm tom and i'm andrea and we're the hosts of we drink and we know things the podcast we're a husband and wife comedy show. We cover all kinds of stuff from UFOs to cryptids. We also cover a lot of true crime and some paranormal. And we do it all while getting drunk. Yeah, we sit in our office, we have a good time, and we have some drinks. Every month we put out bonus episodes. We give you some cool stuff like creepy pastas and the glitch in the matrix. So be sure to come and hang out with us. We're a weekly podcast. Doused in alcohol. And lit with knowledge. Clinkies! And that was We Drink and We Know Things. Go and give them a listen. And if you like them, make sure that you subscribe and binge their podcast. Our film review this week. Our film review is The Witch. The Witch was released in 2015. It has 6.9 out of 10 on IMDb and 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. Would you like a synopsis? Yes, please. New England, 1630. William and Catherine lead a devout Christian life with their five children, homesteading on the edge of an impassable wilderness. When their newborn son mysteriously vanishes and their crops fail, the family begin to turn on each other. Hmm. What were your thoughts on this film? This film was unsettling. It felt very much like watching a play. I think that's because of the crucible (laughs) parallels though. And I don't, I don't mean that in like a negative way. I'm not saying it's like copying the crucible or anything, but because you've got a film about witchcraft set in those puritanical times, it's inevitably going to have the crucible parallels. I think. Yeah, there was a lot of lot of dialogue, very atmospherically shot, very unnerving. There's so much I want to say about this film, but I'm really hesitant because I don't want to give anything away. Yeah, you don't want to ruin it for people, but it's like, I mean, fuck me, their lives were miserable. Like yes. uh, three quarters of the film was just looking repenting. at the misery that they repenting. live in. <laughs> yeah. And then saying that their misery was all, all because of the sin that they had committed and it was yeah. all their own fault. And God, what a life. The acting was sensational across the board. Yeah. Even the two weirdo kids. Yeah. So they've got, there's five kids in the house, the little baby, and then there's a little boy, a teenage girl and two younger and a, and a pair of twins who are younger. And they're all phenomenal actors. I, them, yep. Genuinely, the acting in this film is is outstanding. But fuck me, if anybody was to <laughs> mysteriously disappear in that family, I would be hoping it would be those twins. Oh, the twins are If so I was their mum, I'd be like, do you know what? Take them. Yeah. Take them. Have them. Whoever you are. Whether you're a wolf or a witch, don't give a shit. Just take them and don't bring them back. So it starts with the kids. Uh, the, t- the first time we see the twins is the girl and the boy are holding hands, singing, looking very maniacal. Not a look that you need. Looking very maniacal, singing to a goat called Black Philip. <laughs> yeah, and chasing around this goat <laughs> and yeah, dancing this with This big old and... billy goat. Yeah. And uh, they're doing it in this really high-pitched, irritating voice. And then you get sight of them and the pair of them look like two little old people. <laughs> yeah, they're so weird. And it's like, and they're so naughty as well. Yeah, they're really such naughty, naughty children. <laughs> to, 
to the point where there's one point later on in the film where the parents are so exasperated they tie them around the waist with rope and then tie them to the fence which I just think is genius childcare yeah I, I mean if ever there was lessons in childcare you need to take it from Puritan yeah. settlers that's where you need to take it from but I, I really I, it's a very unsettling film and I still I still don't really know how I feel about it like I don't I think it, it really held my attention the whole way through it's not remotely like modern horror in that there's not jump scares no it's just like you said it's really unsettling not much actually happens no but the thing that really gets me about this is that it's very apparent from the offset that there is really a witch but the way that the play the the play the way that the film unfolds you just get to a point where you just think that all this bluster about this teenage girl being a witch is true and you know it's not Yeah, because you're bloody watching There's so much condemnation coming at you. You're just like, she must be a witch. (laughs) And you can see how people got wrapped up in that narrative (laughs) back in the day. But yeah, that's not a spoiler or anything. You know from the very beginning of the film that there is a witch. And she is pretty horrific, you know, as witches go. I think really for me, the big moral of this film that I took away was don't look at your sister's titties or a witch will rain down hell on your family. That's I mean, all that's, you need to know. I remember world. there was a long time ago when we did a film review and the moral was don't have sex with your siblings. Yep. Today's moral is don't... Don't, don't look at your siblings' no. titties. No, don't look at your siblings' titties. <laughs> I keep saying titties. I'm really sorry. <laughs> we have laughed about this, but I it's not bad funny or anything like that. We're laughing about it because of the way that... The bits that we've remembered, it's not funny in any sense of the word. It's not bad. It doesn't make you laugh. No, it's a good... I would recommend watching it's it. A it good it's a film. It's one of those horror films that's very original and very interesting, really well, really atmospheric and really demonstrates the sheer misery of those people's lives and what that can do and how hard life was for those people. And you really do understand why people turned to witchcraft as a as an understanding of why awful things kept happening to them, especially when they were living lives of absolute piety. Yep where they all they cared about was God and, and praying to God and everything that everything was offered up to God and yeah, just a really miserable existence. I think you said God about twenty five times. I in that did, one yeah. Paragraph. I I recognised that in my head and I didn't enjoy it. So what would you score this out of five? I don't I'm gonna give it a four. I'm gonna give it a four. The reason I'm not giving it a five is because I still don't really know if I actually enjoyed it. Yeah, but I can it, understand that. But it was a gripping film. I'm going to give it a four with, you know, when the fifth star is kind of greyed out. Okay, very specific. <laughs> I can see why people wouldn't like this. Yeah. And if you're looking for jump scares or cheap jump scares, you're not going to get them. That's not this kind of film. If you just want to feel a little bit unnerved, no, a lot unnerved, or if you like folk horror, then this one's for you, I'd say. So our story this week, we are sticking with our witchy theme. And I have a question to ask you before we commence with the story. Go for it. When was the last witch convicted in the UK? I think like 1949. I feel like it was fairly recently. I'm going to tell you a little story. Okay. How close was I? You'll see. Oh. In the 17th century, witch trials reached their peak in the UK. King James I developed an unhealthy obsession with witches after becoming convinced that a coven had summoned a storm which nearly capsized the ship, carrying him and his new wife across the North Sea. He wrote a decree on witches titled Demonology, which prompted men like Matthew Hopkins, the Witchfinder General, to launch a full-scale attack on women all over the country. Hopkins himself was responsible for trying and executing hundreds of women in increasingly violent and grotesque ways. Many believe that the witch trials ended in the late 1700s. But in actual fact, the last witch trials in the UK took place in 1944. Ooh, close. Victoria Helen McRae McFarlane was born on the 25th of November 1897 in Callender, Perthshire, in Scotland. From early childhood, Helen began to show signs that she was different. One time, Helen was in school and the teacher wrote a list of questions on the board. Helen was acutely and painfully aware that she could not in fact answer the questions on the board and busied herself writing and rewriting the question numbers on the slate in front of her 
desperately trying to appear as though she was working out the answers. She prayed and prayed for some sort of divine intervention, desperate to avoid being singled out as a dunce for being unable to answer a single question. To her immense surprise, Helen's prayers were answered and the answers to the questions appeared on the slate in front of her. Dumbfounded, Helen could not explain to her teacher where the answers had come from or why they were written in completely different handwriting. Another time, when Helen was sitting listening to her teacher, the number 1066 was repeating itself over and over in her brain. She was becoming more and more frustrated with the strange numerical mantra when her teacher picked up the chalk and wrote the words Battle of Hastings on the blackboard and then wrote 1066 and promptly suffered a massive heart attack. Initially, Helen's parents were not concerned by their daughter's behaviour. They had female relatives in the family with the gift and assumed Helen had inherited the supernatural ability. But as friends and neighbours became increasingly wary of her strange and sometimes histrionic behaviour, and she became more and more inclined to make dire prophecies, Helen's mother decided to visit the doctor. The doctor found nothing physically wrong with Helen, and was relieved that there was no apparent neurological reason for her daughter's behaviour. She left the office embarrassed, however, after Helen looked the doctor dead in the eye and warned him not to go out in his car that night. The doctor did, in fact, go out in his car, unperturbed by the warnings of a strange teenage girl, and his car skidded wildly off the road in a snowstorm. Helen eventually left her hometown in a swirl of rumours and hostility, and made her way to Dundee at 16 years old. She worked in a munitions factory during World War II and later became a nurse. It was here that she became fast friends with Jean Duncan and thus met Jean's brother Henry. As soon as Henry set eyes on Helen, he said, So we meet at last. They had both had visions of each other for years. Helen and Henry married and had six children together, and a further two that died in infancy. Henry had been honourably discharged from the army, as a bad dose of rheumatic fever had severely damaged his heart, and was now working as a cabinet maker. Helen worked where she could, sewing and mending clothes, and eventually working in a bleach factory. It was during her time in the bleach factory that she had a premonition of Henry in grave danger. She raced to his workshop to find him in the throes of a serious heart attack and it was clear that working full-time was no longer a viable option for him. Henry had always recognised and respected Helen's gift. He believed that she was a phenomenon and that there was ways that they could capitalise on this gift and make their living circumstances just a little bit easier. Working in a bleach factory was tough and dangerous work and they had six hungry mouths to feed. So Henry and Helen set to work, harnessing Helen's gifts. She seemed to possess the gifts of clairvoyance, clairaudience, psychometry, and precognition. In the safety of their own home, Helen and Henry would practice developing these gifts and allowing Helen to reach her full potential. And this was when the voices started. Helen was in a deep, trance-like state when Dr. Williams first appeared as a voice from the ether. Dr. Williams explained to Henry that Helen had a very strong gift and would be able, with practice, to materialise spirits on command. Henry was overcome with excitement, but Helen was frightened of showing her gifts to anyone. It had only ever caused trouble in the past, and she was frightened of the ridicule and the rumours that would plague her family. Dr. Williams became a guiding light for the couple, explaining that with some focus, Helen would be able to produce ectoplasm that would come forth and show the faces of the dead. Dr. Williams instructed Henry to build Helen a wooden cabinet, large enough for her to sit in, 
and that this cabinet would act as a conduit for souls, like a portal or a beacon. He did it, and they were ready for their first seance. In 1926, surrounded by friends and neighbours, the seance began. Henry looked on nervously. The room was lit with a dim red glow. This was not just for atmospheric reasons, but Dr. Williams had explicitly stated that direct light of any kind on the ectoplasm would seriously injure Helen. The neighbours sat facing a wooden cabinet, giggling and whispering, probably waiting to have a good laugh at the expense of Helen and her visibly anxious husband. There were black curtains at the front of the cabinet, which opened slowly to reveal a black satin-clad Helen. She was sat with her head down and her arms resting on the arms of the chair. She seemed to be asleep. The audience grew quiet and stared at this strange sight, looking from Helen to Henry. Henry just watched intently, wringing his hands. Helen flinched, a slight movement in her shoulders and a heavy heaving of her chest. Her mouth opened, and from it came the most awesome sight. While in a trance, Helen began to emit a strange, smoke-like substance from her mouth and nose. The audience gasped. It was like a magical mist, and had a strange flowing quality like, like a living cobweb. It glowed a bright effervescent white and swirled around the space in front of Helen. To the disbelief of the audience, the mist began to take on a shape and settled into the unmistakable form of a human. This human became known as Uncle Albert, one of Helen's spirit guides who acted almost as an MC for her seances. He claimed to be a Scottish man who had set sail for Australia and subsequently drowned there. The audience were also introduced to Peggy, a little girl who was Helen's second spirit guide, who would appear and sing songs and entertain the audience. People were shocked. They watched in awe as Helen's chest rose and fell rhythmically as though she were asleep, and phantom voices filled the air. How on earth was this happening before their eyes? Henry, on the other hand, was thrilled. Finally, other people were vindicating what he had known all along. That his wife had a powerful ability to bring forth the dead. And so, he became her manager. Harry Price had heard rumours of a strange woman up in Scotland who was putting on a show quite unlike any other. He was keen to investigate and Henry was equally as keen to oblige. Harry was readily given a sample of the ectoplasm and was shocked at how it looked. It had been preserved in a bottle of distilled water and was indeed almost like a living spider web. Convinced that this was going to be the case to prove the afterlife, Price sent the sample to a chemist and eagerly awaited the results. It was egg whites, <laughs> mixed with chemicals, and in some cases, a mix of cheesecloth, egg whites, and pieces of toilet paper. But, undeterred, Price wanted to see the bizarre phenomenon for himself and offered Helen £50 to be x-rayed before and after a trance, to which Helen readily agreed to. The results of this experiment were so shocking that Price recounted them as follows in a report of the incident. At the conclusion of the fourth seance, we led the medium to a settee and called for the apparatus. At the sight of it, the lady promptly went into a trance, She recovered, but refused to be x-rayed. Her husband went up to her and told her it was painless. She jumped up and gave him a smashing blow to the face, which sent him reeling. Then she went for Dr. William Brown, who was also present. He dodged the blow, 
Mrs. Duncan, without the slightest warning, dashed out into the street, had an attack of hysteria and began to tear her seance garment to pieces. She clutched the railings and screamed and screamed. Her husband tried to pacify her, it was useless. I leave the reader to visualise the scene. A 17 stone woman, clad in black satin tights, locked to the railings, screaming at the top of her voice. A crowd collected and the police arrived. The medical men with us explained the position and prevented them from fetching the ambulance. We got her back into the laboratory and at once she demanded to be x-rayed. In reply, Dr. William Brown turned to Mr. Duncan and asked him to turn out his pockets. He refused and would not allow us to search him. There is no question that his wife had passed him the cheesecloth in the street. However, they gave us another seance and the control said we could cut off a piece of the teleplasm when it appeared. The sight of half a dozen men, each with a pair of scissors, waiting for the word, was definitely amusing. It came and we all jumped. One of the doctors got hold of the stuff and secured a piece. The medium screamed, and the rest of the teleplasm went down her throat. This time, it wasn't cheesecloth. It proved to be paper soaked in white of an egg and folded into a flattened tube. Could anything be more infantile than a group of grown-up men wasting time, money and energy on the antics of a fat female crook? So, the parapsychology community were less than amused, and this coupled with the fact that the ectoplasm was proven to be cheesecloth, with faces cut from magazines stuck on, only added fuel to the sceptic's fire. The problem is, most hard-working, working-class people in Scottish towns and villages wouldn't have had access to scientific reports. And therefore, Helen maintained her authenticity and continued to perform seances for the masses. It was at one of these seances that Helen had her first brush with the law. The seance was going swimmingly, A full crowd of punters, all enraptured by the living cobwebs and the spirits coming forward from the ether. That is until the arrival of Peggy. Peggy had become an audience favourite. I mean, who doesn't love a little girl ghost who erupts from the nostrils of a grown woman and sings haunting songs to you? As Peggy came forth to make her usual appearance, it became too much for an audience member called Miss Essen Maul. Miss Maul leaped forward and grabbed Peggy. A ruckus ensued and the lights were turned on, revealing a dishevelled Miss Maul and Helen grappling on the stage over an elaborately stuffed vest. The police were called and Helen was fined £10 for fraudulent mediumship. To this day... Helen's ancestors claim that Miss Maul had in fact grabbed an undervest from Helen's bag and that she readily admitted in court that it did not seem possible that Helen was the source of the voices that she had heard at the seance. Dr Marguerite Link Hutchinson testified in the court case that she had examined Helen's naked body prior to each seance and that it was impossible for her to either be concealing ectoplasm or have the ability to regurgitate that amount of material without producing any bodily fluid. Dr. Link Hutchinson had seen Helen eat a meal before the seance and had remained with her until the seance began and saw no evidence of the consumption of pre-prepared ectoplasm or of any residual food from her stomach on any ectoplasm produced. Mr. Ernest Oten, president of the International Spiritualist Federation, had attended 18 of Helen's seances and testified that it was impossible for Helen to fake the phenomena that he witnessed, further testifying that the spirits he witnessed at the seances were of different intelligences, forms and all had different voices and accents. Despite what seemed to be another devastating blow to her credibility, Helen's popularity continued to grow and she began to travel the length and breadth of the UK. 
During the 1930s and 40s, she travelled to numerous spiritualist churches. Demand for seances grew exponentially, as people lost more and more loved ones to war, and others were desperate to know if their loved ones were still alive. In 1941, Helen conducted two seances that would go on to redefine her life, and ultimately, her legacy. It was the 24th of May, in Edinburgh, and Helen was doing her usual bit, except she had moved on from just Peggy and Uncle Albert, and had adopted a decidedly more war-themed approach to her shows. What Helen didn't realise was that in the audience on this night was a man named Brigadier Firebrace, who had deep connections to British intelligence. He listened as Uncle Albert announced the tragic sinking of a British battleship. Albert also claimed that the Russians would enter the war on the side of the Allies, which seemed highly unlikely as they'd signed a non-aggression pact with Nazi Germany in 1939, and that the war would end with two big bangs. Firebrace was worried. He obviously had a lot of faith in Helen's abilities, because that night he listened intently for news of a sunken battleship, and hearing none, he called an admiral to confirm. The admiral scoffed, and told him that there was no sunken battleships. But the next morning, Firebrace received a phone call. It was the same officer, flustered and confused. The HMS Hood had been sunk the night before, and Firebrace had seemingly known before anybody else did. Unbeknownst to Helen, she had piqued the interest of British intelligence forces. In November 1941, Helen held a seance in Portsmouth, the home of the Royal Navy. While channeling for an audience full of desperate people, the mist of a soldier appeared. He seemed to be wearing a hat that had HMS Barham printed on it. He announced that he was from the crew of the HMS Barham. He was the son of two audience members and that many lives had been lost. The mother of this fallen soldier was so panicked by the news that she called the Navy, who informed her that this was not true. But it was true. The wartime government had been trying to hush up the loss of 861 British seamen when the German U-boat U-331 torpedoed the ship. They wanted to keep morale up and also to encourage Germany to continue using resources to search for a phantom boat. Again, Helen seemed to have predicted something that she could not have had knowledge of, and rumours spread all over town that the HMS Barham had sunk. Helen was being watched by the army, and she had no idea. In January 1944, two Navy officers attended one of her seances and reported her to the police. On the 19th of January, police raided a seance and arrested Helen, the husband and wife who had organised the seance and Helen's assistant. Helen was put on trial in a media sensation. She was initially arrested under Section 4 of the Vagrancy Act 1824, a minor offence tried by magistrates. The authorities regarded the case as more serious and eventually discovered Section 4 of the Witchcraft Act 1735 covering fraudulent spiritual activity, which was triable before a jury. She was found guilty and sentenced to nine months in prison. There is an overwhelming school of thought that believed that Helen was charged because army intelligence feared that she would leak D-Day plans in one of her seances and needed her locked up to protect the information. Whether she was getting secret army updates from the undead or from a very much alive source was irrelevant. They were not taking any chances. 
Helen Duncan was released from prison on the 22nd of September 1944. However, the harassment she faced appeared to have continued right up until her death. In November 1956, the police raided a private seance in Nottingham in an attempt to prove fraud. Once again, the investigators failed in their objectives. Five weeks later, the woman who will always be remembered as the last witch died. But she wasn't. The last witch, that is. There was another less sensational story that came afterwards. Jane Rebecca York was found guilty on seven counts against the Witchcraft Act of 1735 after an undercover police officer attended one of her seances. York was fined £5 and placed on good behaviour for three years, promising that she would hold no more seances. The light sentence was due to her age of 72. So what are your thoughts? Great story. Helen Duncan, the last witch of England. But she wasn't. But she wasn't. <laughs> I mean, also, listen. I'm not sure a Scottish lady would like you saying she's the last witch of England. Oh, that's very true. <laughs> the last witch of the UK. That's better. I'm going to post the photos of her seances on to Instagram and I'll put them on Facebook as well so that if you want to see what those seances looked like you will get to see that I mean it's a woman with cloth coming out of her mouth I don't know how they did it with the seances I honestly don't know how they convince people it's incredible maybe she was actually had the power to reproduce cloth in within her intestines maybe she did They're Harry Price so the great yeah. psychical researcher he believed that she had two stomachs. Possible. Like a cheesecloth stomach but he and was a food also stomach. also very obsessed with the fact that she was overweight. Yes, which is chaotic. <laughs> which may just land weight to his theory. She's fat, she's got to have two stomachs, is what he was saying, essentially, yeah. isn't it? I mean, he clearly, from that extract from yeah. his report, like he clearly hated her. Yep. Hated her. Yep. Lots of choice language in that as well. Yeah. Hysterical and... Yeah, which is very female-centred yeah. yep. language used to describe women who maybe just didn't fit the mould yeah. or who had an opinion. I'm not even going to go down this road because if I start talking about this, I'll never stop. There's two things in the story, though. There's the level of truth to the seance, which is doubtful. But then there's the fact that she obviously did have some kind of premonitive sight. I think that's the worst of kind of the gift. Because what do you do about it? You can't really do anything, can you? Everybody's seen Final Destination. If you do something, it just comes back at you later. Which one would you prefer to have? <laughs> so she was clairvoyant, clairaudi, clair, clair listening, whatever that one is. Yep. She had the ability, psychometry, so to touch things and understand their past or, under, or know things about a person from an item that belonged to them. Apparently, she was really accurate with that. Apparently. I would have the touch thing. Would you? Yeah, because then I'd be like a a mystery solving detective. So you just take me to his crime scene and I'd just touch the knife and I'd be like... Mm. So do you think that she really saw the future? Yeah, I think she did. She got a lot of stuff about World War II right. Well, we know she got two things right. Yeah, but she said about the war ending... Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, big bangs yes. As well, which it did. Two big bangs and that Russia would join on the Allies' yeah. side and... And that, at the point when she made that premonition... I don't think there was a lot of sight of Russia changing sides. No. Because they were aligned with the Nazis. Unless she had military intelligence. But even with military intelligence sight, like, insight, like if she knew someone from military intelligence or something like that, it's very accurate. It's almost too accurate to just be able to... So when I was Hang researching on. this... Is this, this one of these ones where you just tell no, me some groundbreaking news? No, this isn't. Okay. I don't have any groundbreaking news. But when I was researching this, um, I actually, for the first time ever, I started by looking at wikipedia and then i created the story from her website that her family upkeep from her own web wow see that's how advanced she was she has she's got her own website she had it before the time (laughs) so her family upkeep this website um, and they're trying to get her her conviction overturned posthumously which i can kind of get but also she was doing witchy shit i'm kind of into it so I took a lot of the story from there because their version of the story is obviously far more interesting. But they still firmly believe that she had all of these abilities and more, that she was genuinely this great psychic, this great medium. And then the Wikipedia 
is a lot more damning of her. And within the Wikipedia, apparently the sinking of the HMS Baron, while it was kept a secret 100%, they actually had informed the family members of the people that had died. So one of the predictions was that, so not predictions, one of the estimations from one of the naval officers was that there was 831 or whatever, I can't remember what the amount was, but 800 odd men that died, all of their family members were informed that they had died, but they were also informed that they couldn't tell anybody. And he said, you know, human nature is, is that you have to tell somebody. So people were going to be told. the mother ringing around to find out if something No. And he estimated that 20,000 people actually probably knew about the sinking of the HMS Barham. And he believed that they, they, there is a belief that they were concerned that if this amount of gossip was going on, but she was the one announcing it publicly, that she genuinely would be a threat to the D-Day landings. And there's two stories about when she was arrested. One was that there was two naval officers that were there who were just disgusted by her behaviour, that she was saying to them, oh, your aunt is here. And he'd be like, I don't have a dead aunt. And she'd be like, oh, it's your sister. And he'd be like, oh, I don't don't have a dead sister. So they just were disgusted by her and called the police because of her fraudulent activity, not because she was making all these incredible predictions. But then her family's website say that it was the mother of one of the sailors who was lost on the HMS Barham that kind of blew the whistle on her accidentally. It wasn't uncommon to have people in the audience snooping on people. So if the mother did know, that could have worked its way to her. Because it is it's a well-known, like Darren Brown talks about it all the time, about the way that like certain mediums in that spiritualist age used to... Or put a plant in the audience. Yeah, okay. And sort of find out information. But not not just having a plant in the audience, but also sort of pre-researching the audience and, and looking for tells and listening to conversations beforehand and after. There must have been enough to rattle someone. Or at convicted. the very least, really piss them off. Yeah, but I don't feel like... It wouldn't have been an ask to just convict her on fraudulent terms and lock her up that way. No, it wouldn't. But it was finding the right law to convict her under. Yeah, was what they needed. Apparently, yeah, but, but the, that's what, what that's what I'm. But that's what I'm saying. If, if she was just annoying, there's not the need to go that extra length to find something that actually puts her away. It's it's interesting. That's the yeah. interesting bit about it. Why did they put if her they away? Because they haven't got a lot of money. If they f- f- fine her a substantial fine, that has the impact anyway, doesn't it? I mean, essentially, they put her away until the end of the war. Yeah. Which is saying something, right? Yeah. But allegedly she did seances regularly for Churchill. And he is on record writing a letter to the judge at the time of her arrest and imprisonment. Basically slamming them for, you know, imprisoning somebody so ridiculously for such a ridiculous, outdated crime. But that's not surprising that Churchill was would have a seance with her because if you think about what was going on on the other side of the war with the Nazis and their obsession with the occult, everybody's looking for that edge, I guess. And I feel like they, they like lots of governments at the time were doing loads of research into psychic yeah. abilities and how they could weaponize it. Mm-hmm. They still are, which is completely mad, isn't that crazy? Uh, it's the it's like the early form of psychic warfare, I guess, isn't it? And using different methods to get one up on your enemies. So. For example, they in modern more modern times they used to pump Metallica music into the cells of prisoners in Guantanamo Bay to unsettle them to the point where they would confess to things that they potentially didn't do. Really? Yeah. Oh, I never knew that. Yeah. So it's just like the sort of more advanced form of stuff like that, isn't it? Really, it's it's it's, it's sort of working out how to get an edge up on your enemy. And I guess the top brass, when you're at, sitting at the top of all your scientific discoveries, and you're still not getting ahead the opposition then you start to explore other avenues that's, and that's there... basically what Hitler was doing with his occult obsession found it I guess if you look at the outcome and that it led to two atomic bombs which were obscene weapons they were trying to create the best possible thing that they can wrong word for it but you know you know I, mean? I know what you mean the most powerful yeah. weapon that they could possibly create it's just a mad story and I feel like 
it's interesting that the witch trials were abhorrent like and everybody everybody knows that and they were fundamentally perpetrated against women yeah. for the most part there were obviously some men who were tried and convicted but if you were a woman in society who was vaguely different than anybody else or who dared to have an opinion or all of those things you ran the risk of dying this horrific death mm. by witch trial so it's really interesting that actually when they needed it it was perfectly fine to use those same ridiculous laws again to put somebody away to put somebody in prison there are people who believe that her time in prison actually really benefited her so she was really unhealthy she was actually quite unwell prior to going into prison and her family maintained that the nature of the seances made her gave her like this this appetite that she just couldn't suppress or couldn't couldn't satisfy and uh, you know she was supposed to have been really diabetic and and had a heart condition or whatever and then the kind of routine and lifestyle of prison actually really suited her and she became quite healthy there are those that argue that when she died she was in a trance and it was to do with the police busting in and trying to arrest her and whatever but actually there is no evidence that that is the case she just died because of a potentially unhealthy lifestyle and that was it I don't know whether your research can prove or disprove this thing, but knowing the nature of the British Constitution, it's very possible that that law still exists. Because we don't get rid of anything. Our Constitution is just a collection of papers, so it's not like America where they have a fixed Constitution. Ours is an, what's known as an unwritten Constitution, and it's just a collection of laws. And so if you don't purposely shut a law down, it still applies. The law was shut down. Okay, there you go. So the law was shut down to be something, something like fraudulent spiritualism, where if you were seen to be conning money from people essentially or distressing people unnecessarily when there was no proof that you were speaking to the dead or whatever, then you could be charged for it. And then later it was changed to the the kind of very basic laws around goods and services that we have now. So actually... Just consumer it's, rights. Like. It's, yeah, it's consumer <laughs> rights. So now what went from being witchcraft to fraudulent spiritualism yeah. to essentially consumer goods and services. Today, you cannot sue somebody or bring somebody to court for fraudulent spiritualism because it would be obviously thrown out of court because you can't prove it either way. But back then, the witchcraft laws were just very useful. And it was must have been a raging problem in society if you've got these you know within a couple of months of each other these two women were tried as witches Mm. in a relatively modern society which is insane i wonder how much the stories bled into popular culture because you're talking like just over a decade maybe two decades at the most bed knobs and broomsticks was released that's about a witch changing the outcome of world war ii is it pretty much Apparently, she was so popular or so well known that a news broadcast of the Russian advance, the Russian army advance, was interrupted to bring the people news of her arrest. Well, that is (laughs) allegedly how popular she was. I have no proof of that, but that's Hmm. what is alleged. Interesting. It does raise all those questions about the site and the gifts that you that are in your law. I think she probably did have a gift. It's interesting that I her family... I think the family... seances were a bit of a fiddle. Oh, I mean, I'm going to show you the pictures and <laughs> you'll see. I mean, it literally... there There is one picture where it is literally... You can clearly see that it's a piece of cloth with somebody's face stuck onto it. Because that was the whole thing about the ectoplasm, wasn't it? That it would show you the faces of the dead and blah, blah, blah. I'm really impressed at their showmanship to be able to do that. Like, how did they create this misty uncle albert figure and this little girl called peggy and where do the voices come from because apparently it was very clearly not her that she would be in a trance mouth closed or like the stuff coming out of her mouth and breathing very normally and steadily and rhythmically so i don't know i guess you've got to have some bells and whistles though, haven't you even yeah. if there's a genuine genuine power because you if you just did it in a normal voice oh, it'd be very boring people would just be like well you're just talking rubbish yeah, you're just talking in your normal voice. I don't yeah. believe you. No, the so minute you put she, so on an Australian accent. Absolutely. So she does She does what the people, gives the people what they want. And then they're like, oh, you know, you're just faking it now. You haven't even got a power. I'm going to send you to prison. Well, what she said was that the spirits will always appear in a form that the viewer will understand and be able to relate to. That was her reasoning for when... Paper on cloth. Yeah, everyone can relate to that. <laughs> egg whites. We've yeah. all seen an egg white. We have. 
toilet paper. Everyone uses yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. It's fine. Exactly. <laughs> What's your final oh, verdict? I think she was a lady that had a gift and used that, exploited that gift to earn some money when her husband couldn't work full time. Which, who's to say, the best of us wouldn't do the same thing. Absolutely. If you've got six kids to feed, mm. I, I, I feel for her because six kids to feed, he can't work. She can only do certain jobs. Who wants to work in a bleach factory? That, that, that shit's definitely going to kill you. I mean, go for it. Eat some cheesecloth. Vomit back up again. Get everyone to put a pound in a jar. Fine. I'm here for it. What do you think? I think she was a very clever con artist. And I think she probably had some sort of in. If she, say, say if it is true that Winston Churchill did have seances with her, which allegedly he did. She probably did seances for lots of people that were high and in power and maybe heard things she shouldn't have heard. I think she probably had an in and that's what the government were actually worried well, about. She'd have to have a massive in to know about the Manhattan Project before, before it was ready to use. She might as well have been one of the scientists. I Maybe was. she was. <laughs> and the bomb's made of cheese, cheese cloth, cloth and egg. egg <laughs> Nobody knows how it works, but it just does. <laughs> Would you like some new reviews? Please. Our first review comes from Julia Wagoner 12 and it's entitled Spooks. I stumbled across this podcast about three days ago and I haven't stopped listening since. I love this podcast, although it's a love-hate relationship. I love the content, but some of the ghost stories scared the crap out of me. It's amazing. I feel you. And our second one comes from Caitlin Edgen. Really love it. I love how much fun this podcast is. It is the right mixture of funny and spooky that is perfect. It always seems that I listen to the creepiest while I'm at home alone, which is always great. Even though it does get a bit creepy, I always look forward to the next episode. Thank you very much. And finally, we have BCS42, terrifyingly hilarious. I've been looking for a good paranormal podcast for years and I finally found it. Great audio, amazing banter, and I love how there's a great balance between debunking and believed. Best podcast ever. Thank you all so much for your reviews. That's so nice of you. It's very nice. We love you all. We're just going to talk at the same time for the rest of the podcast. Because um, uh, that, that's the audio that everybody wants, yeah. really. <laughs> so if you enjoyed this week's episode, you can find me on Instagram at Real Life Ghost Stories. You can find Dan on Instagram. At 50p Movie Club. You can find us on Twitter. At Real Ghost Pod. You can find us on Facebook, Real Life Ghost Stories Podcast. Give the page a like, leave a review if you feel so inclined. And also join our supergroup or LGS supergroup. The password is... Emma and Dan. And it is the most wholesome place on the internet. I thought you were going to say it's the most haunted place on the internet. There. I was like, oh. <laughs> well, that's a big claim to me. But it is also the most wholesome place on the internet. You can also support us on Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash real life ghost stories. Where for $5 a month, you get extra episodes every week. And for $2 a month, what do you get? Episodes of a podcast called 50p Movie Club, which used to be me and Will. And is now me and Dave Keen. And will one day me be me, Will and Dave Keen, where we watch bad movies and we talk about them. Thank you very much. That was very concise. I enjoyed it. If you want to send in your own spooky ghost story, you can do so to real life ghost stories podcast at gmail.com and subscribe to our youtube channel buy our merch all that stuff links are all in the description and on that note we shall see you next week bye